Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. The message today is entitled, The Free and the Brave. The Free and the Brave. We've sung those words not long ago as we sang our national anthem. But what does it mean to be truly free? What does it mean to be truly brave? What does God's word have to say about freedom and about courage in expressing that freedom which is ours in Christ? All freedom ultimately stems from gifts that God has given. All freedom ultimately stems from the word of God itself, for that is the root and the source of every varied form of freedom. Whether we are talking political freedom, or religious freedom, or economic freedom, or social freedom, or whatever kind of freedom you want to speak of, it all goes back to the word of God. Then the question becomes, for those who have found this freedom, do they have the courage to speak it? Are they brave enough to defend it? Are they willing, as patriotic men and women have done for our country, to even lay down their lives for the truth of the liberty that is ours in Christ? I read some selected verses out of Galatians chapter 5 just a few moments ago. Let me just read several of those key verses again in our text that deals with our liberty in Christ. Stand fast, therefore. There is the possibility that we might not stand fast. When those who have liberty do not stand fast, the liberty is soon eroded and the liberty soon evaporates. We see that happening in our country around us today. And so the first word of exhortation is stand fast. But standing fast in what? In the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. There is a special liberty for those who know Christ. There are many forms of liberty, but some of them are actually not liberty. They are bondage, as we will see in the text. The liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. The only liberty that lasts, the only liberty that is permanent, is the liberty that is found in Christ. And he explains it in the last part of verse 1. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. It is possible for one who has been free to once again become a slave. It is possible for one who has been made free to be tangled up in something which restricts the freedom that he has in Christ. It's a yoke of bondage. Paul explains it in verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Paul uses an important theological term here in verse 4. The term justified. When we deal with the doctrine of justification, we are going back to the heart of the Reformation. The just shall live by faith. Justification is a term that has been redefined both by the world and by apostate organizations such as the organization of Rome. Justification is not what makes you righteous. Justification is what declares you righteous. 
Rome has tried to redefine it so that they can take the book of James and say you are made righteous by works because James speaks of a justification that is by works. But justification, that word means to be declared righteous. In the sight of God, we are declared righteous by faith. And as James explains, in the sight of men, we are declared righteous by our works. They cannot see our faith. They can only see what is the result of our faith. Christ has become of no effect to you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. If you think the law is going to declare you righteous, you have a bizarre concept of the law. The law never could declare you righteous, for the law only condemns. The law is not made for a righteous man, Paul tells Timothy, but for the ungodly and profane, for unholy and for sinners, for murders of fathers, murders of mothers, manslayers, whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Paul explains that the law is good if it is used for a lawful purpose. That is, it condemns sin. You think you can be justified by the law? Paul says to us here, you are fallen from grace. Do you not understand what grace is all about? Grace is God extending his greatest compassion to those who are sinners, not to those who are righteous. The Bible tells us Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and Paul adds, of whom I am chief. Paul was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. He was a man who meticulously followed the law, and yet he discovered that the law condemned him and slew him. If you think that you are declared righteous by the law, you are fallen from grace. Because grace is what God extends to those who are guilty. Grace is what God extends to those who are sinners, who are lost, who are undone, who are helpless and incapable of saving themselves. You are fallen from grace. Verse 5, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We're not looking forward to the future because we've kept so much of the law. But by faith, Verse 7, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You were doing fine, you Galatians, but somebody came in. Somebody said something. Somebody changed your mind. Somebody perverted the gospel of Christ, as he explains in chapter 1. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach unto you any other gospel than that which you have received. Let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again. Let him be accursed. Any other gospel than the gospel preached by Paul. That was the gospel of grace, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Only Christ can save you. It's not what you can do to get saved. It's what Christ has done. That's the good news. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. What is true liberty? What is the liberty that we have been called to, that we have been welcomed into, that we have been given as a gift? Well, he tells us here it's not the right to do whatever your flesh wants to do. Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But it does have practical application. This liberty, this liberty makes us servants. Last phrase, but by love serve one another. True liberty is motivated by love. And love always has the desire to serve the one who is love. Those of you who are married uh, understand that concept. The desire to serve the one whom you love. 
That's an expression of the relationship of the believer to Christ. Because we love him, we have a heartfelt desire that we want to serve him. Because love always motivates to service the one whom we love. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus said that was one of the two greatest commands. Paul is making the application for Christians. We know about loving God. Everybody believes that. But loving one another? Loving the guy sitting in the pew behind or in front of me or the lady in the pew or behind or in front of me? Loving them? I can't imagine serving them. Love serves. If you've made it through that first command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then you come to the second, which is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Galatians missed it. They had let somebody put them back under the law as their means of accomplishing salvation and sanctification. Paul says, don't you remember what Jesus taught? You say you love God. If you do, love your neighbor as yourself. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. That's where real freedom comes in willing, voluntary, loving service. Not in doing your own thing. This I say then, walk in the spirit. Aha, there's the key. You can't do it by yourself. Your flesh will never motivate you to love. It will motivate you to lust. It will motivate you to desire. It will motivate you to try to obtain something for yourself. Even when you give to someone else, if it's the flesh, it will be for an ulterior motive that somehow, directly or indirectly, it will benefit you. But that is not God's way. Walk in the Spirit. He's the only one who can empower you to love this way. He's the only one who can give you the liberty that comes this way. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, the flesh and the spirit are contrary to one to the other. If you're walking in the spirit, you are not walking in the flesh. If you are walking in the flesh, you are not walking in the spirit. What's the choice? Which way are you going to choose to walk? But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Verses 25 and 26. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now as we look at Galatians chapter 5, and I've just given you a quick overview. We have many things to say about it. As we look at Galatians chapter 5, the text for today... The specific issue with which Paul is dealing was a demand by the Judaizers that the church should require circumcision. A study of the book of Galatians reveals that some required circumcision for salvation and some required it for sanctification. We'll be dealing with that in much more detail when we get to the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 in our evening services. And so we're not going to talk about circumcision now, which is the illustration that Paul gives to set forth these massive principles of our liberty in Christ. So we're not going to deal with that issue here. We'll talk about it on Sunday evenings. But this passage in Galatians is one of the key passages in Scripture that sets out the overarching principles of what is true Christian liberty, what it is and what it is not. 
Liberty is certainly an appropriate theme for this week as we remember the freedom that God has given here to us in the United States. We've just celebrated Independence Day, and you know that. It's with grateful thanksgiving that we, as United States citizens, look back to 1776 and to the establishment of our country as an independent nation. I think all of you know that I've just returned from a foreign land that is under totalitarian domination, the domination of atheistic communism, where I helped my daughter, in a small way, adopt two tiny children. It was, in a sense, a rescue operation to save two castaway children from death, from oppression, from authoritarianism, from miserable lives, from pagan philosophy, from evolutionary indoctrination, and from a vacuum where they would probably never hear the gospel. God enabled that rescue operation to succeed. And they're now in a loving Christian home. They are now United States citizens. They are now in an environment where they will hear the gospel of Christ. And we pray for their salvation at an early age. But returning to the United States made me realize just how blessed we are here to have the political and economic and social and religious freedoms that we so much enjoy. But in Galatians 5, Paul is speaking of an even more valuable freedom that we have. I just reread a few of the key verses from chapter 5 that outline the principles of liberty for us. This is a text that deals with a people who are truly free versus people who are under the heavy hand of sin, the oppressive hand of legalism, enslaved domination of trying to earn their salvation or their sanctification by the works of the law. Paul uses the illustration of circumcision, but he uses it to establish the primary principle boundaries of true Christian liberty. He uses three sets of contrary systems to do this. And then he ends by contrasting the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. The first contrast that he offers here in our text, as you look at it, the first contrast that he offers for our consideration is the flesh versus the Spirit. That's the first contrast in this passage the flesh versus the Spirit. Now, the reason he offers three different sets of contrasts is because they're talking about three different things. This first contrast is a contrast between the two principal empowerments that struggle for supremacy in the Christian life in our pursuit of freedom. Either you are going to be empowered by the flesh or you are going to be empowered by the Spirit of God. So the first set of contrasts is in the area of empowerment in the struggle for supremacy in the Christian life. The second set of contrasts that Paul presents for our consideration is works versus faith. Works versus faith. That contrast focuses on a different point It focuses on the two principal means that people follow in their pursuit of salvation or sanctification. The two principal means for trying to obtain salvation or sanctification. So first were empowerments. Are you going to have the right empowerment in striving for that goal? But the second issue is, do you have the right means for striving for that goal. The third set of contrasts that Paul hammers out is law versus a grace-love couplet. Law versus a grace-love couplet. That's a contrast between the two principal 
motivations, the two principal motivations that people follow in their desire to be justified and sanctified. A contrast of empowerments, flesh versus spirit. A contrast of means, works versus faith. A contrast of motivation. Is it the law that is motivating you to this? The law of the slave driver that pushes you forward? Or is your motivation the grace and love of God? It's important that we have the right one at each of those three stages, each of those three areas. Because if we don't, we're going to find ourselves falling into that horrible first category, which results in the works of the flesh, rather than to the second category at the end of this chapter, whereby the gracious Spirit of God bears his fruit in our lives, apart from our works, apart from the law, apart from the empowerment of the flesh. It merely flows through us, pushing out that which is bad and bearing fruit in the lives of the believer. Important to understand the empowerments, the means, and the motivation. And then Paul gives us those capstones, the result of what will happen if you try to follow the flesh, which is human good works and the law of Moses. It only results in works of the flesh. Or the capstone, the results of what will happen if you come under the control of the Holy Spirit, if you walk by faith, if you manifest grace and love, it always results in the fruit of the Spirit. I think it is in this and in this alone that Christian liberty truly lies. Now I'm going to say a few things here that if you don't remember anything else in the message, I hope you remember this. True Christian liberty is not a right. We're so used to thinking in the political context and in the context of the marvelous freedom that we have in this country that our liberties are a right. Christian liberty is not a right. Christian liberty is an empowerment that makes us free from the bondage of sin and death. True Christian liberty is not the right to do what we want. True Christian liberty is the empowerment to do what we ought. Let me say that again. Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want. Christian liberty is the empowerment to do what you ought. Oh, if you can only remember that. When you're faced with temptation either to legalism or libertinism, that brings you back to center. Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want. Christian liberty is the empowerment to do what you ought. Christians have no rights that we can demand from God. We have turned all of our rights over to him when we trusted in Christ. After salvation, all of our so-called rights are now subject to the will of God as revealed in the word of God. And that is where we find our truest freedom. We are only free when we are doing what God designed for us to do. We are not free when we are being enslaved by sin. We are not free when we are indulging the flesh with wickedness. We are not free when we believe the lies of the devil that destroy our lives. We are not free when we are walking according to the course of this world and its peer pressure. Our freedom comes when we allow the Spirit of God to lift us up above the filth of the world, just as the power of the fuel and the engines lift a multi-ton airplane above the surface of the earth. We have true liberty when we allow the Spirit of God to flow through us, cleansing us with the blood of Christ and empowering us to serve God with joy and power. True liberty comes when, by the power of the Spirit of God, we do things that glorify God. When we are empowered by the Holy Spirit and in our obedience to the Word of God. Remember, the Holy Spirit will never empower you. The Holy Spirit will never motivate you. 
to violate the Bible. Every time that we disobey the word of God, we are walking in the flesh. Disobedience to the Bible is not Christian liberty. The definition of truly good works, works that are done in the power of the Holy Spirit and obedience to the word of God, to the glory of God. If it doesn't meet all three of those tests, it is not a good work in the sight of God. Good works are not a matter of keeping the law of Moses in the power of the flesh to the glory of the Pharisee who does them. Certainly there are no good works which violate the principles of the word of God, even though the world may view them as good works. You know, there are things that the world says are good works, and yet they are definitely not good works in the sight of God. For example, some time ago, we had a missionary speaker here who was working among the poor in a third world country. Many of the children in that country died from starvation. The missionary commented that the solution for these poor people was that they needed training in family planning and birth control, and that would solve their problems. That was in this church, folks. I heard it, and so did some of you. Oh, really? That's the solution that is offered by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And all three, the world, the flesh, and the devil, will say a hearty amen to the words of the missionary on that occasion. Murdering babies by abortifacient drugs is not a glorious substitute for letting babies starve to death. But the world tells you it is. Dear people, we need to start thinking like Christians if we want to experience true Christian liberty. Just because the world, the flesh, or the devil says that you have the freedom to do something does not make it so. Legalism never brings liberty, but immoral license never brings liberty either. Libertinism, which is the way most of the world lives, brings you into bondage just as swiftly as legalism does. Both legalism and libertinism are both your deadly enemies. Both legalism and libertinism are both enemies to your true freedom in Christ. And that's Paul's theme in our text here in Galatians today. As we study the book of Galatians, we discover that legalism is not merely the establishment of boundaries for right and wrong. Many people will tell you, if you have any restrictions in your life, you are a legalist. But that's not true. Because God has established boundaries for right and wrong in his word. But our spiritual enemies try to do two things against us. Number one, they try to blur the boundaries. Where is the boundary really located? They want you to have a boundary any place but where God put it. Doesn't matter where, they want to blur the boundary. Uh, it's got to be a fuzzy boundary. You don't really want to know where the boundaries are. Maybe there's not really even a boundary over in this area somewhere. They blur the boundaries. The second thing they do is they redefine the terms. You know, that is the way that um, men control other men. That's the way the church is infiltrated. Where people use orthodox terms, but have redefined the terms to mean something the Bible does not mean. That's how liberalism crept in in the 20s and the 30s. As they were still using orthodox terms, but they had redefined the terms to mean something else than they meant, especially in relation to the person and work of Christ. That's where the devil attacks, blur the boundaries, redefine the terms. Those are the two areas where you need to be alert to spiritual battle. The legalist wants to move the boundaries to require more than God requires in some area. The libertine wants to move the boundaries to require less than God requires in some area. Both of them try to redefine the terms of the conflict so that either you must defend ground that God has not called you to defend or you fail to defend ground that God requires you to defend. So what is true legalism? Legalism, as we find out both in Acts and also in Galatians, 
is when someone requires certain so-called good works in order to obtain, I emphasize the word obtain, in order to obtain salvation or sanctification. Sometimes the legalists require you to keep the law of Moses to be saved. Sometimes they require you to keep the law of Moses to be sanctified. That's one of the main heresies Paul deals with here in the book of Galatians. Sometimes they require you to keep the works of men. They say, well, you know, we, we mess with the law of Moses over here, but, but we've got some works of men that you've got to keep in order to be saved. We've got some works of men that you've got to keep in order to be sanctified. And of course, that's what we see in Roman Catholicism with its masses, purgatory, worshiping of Mary and the saints, novenas, pilgrimages to Rome, relics, and other trappings of human so-called good works. But in the Bible, legalism is only when someone requires kind of works either to be saved or to obtain sanctification. That's important to understand when somebody calls you a legalist. I've been called a legalist many times in my life, and that's why I did a study on every place that this issue shows up, both Old Testament and New Testament. Somebody's going to call you a legalist because you have personal standards. Somebody's going to call you a legalist because you refuse to smoke or drink or take drugs or fornicate with them. So they say if you have standards, you're a legalist. Let's clarify the bottom line. Both salvation and sanctification are by faith and by faith alone. I think you're all familiar with the various verses that talk about salvation by faith alone. That's the heart of the Reformation. We're the heirs of the Reformation. But are you aware that sanctification is also by faith alone? Paul rehearsed his Damascus Road experience in Acts chapter 26 when he was on trial. And listen to what he said. This is Paul speaking in his defense just before he is shipped off to Rome. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. This is referring back to the experience in Acts chapter 9. Shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise, Stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, now listen to verse 18, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Now remember, this is Jesus speaking as I read this last phrase. And an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. To them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. Not only salvation, but sanctification is by faith. That is why Paul is exhorting the Galatians in Galatians 5 to walk in the Spirit and to walk by faith. He ties those two things together. Dear people, you are sanctified by faith. Not only at the point of your salvation, but the Christian life is a walk of faith. It's not a walk that puts you back under the slavery of the law. It's a walk by faith. 
It's a walk that responds to the grace of God by loving Him supremely with a desire that wants to do what pleases Him. And it is such a love that it spills over to where we love our neighbors as ourselves. Instead of putting us first, we put Jesus first, that's the J. Others second, that's the O. Yourself last, that's the Y. J-O-Y. That's what Paul's talking about here. That's where true Christian liberty is found. There's the joy that comes from knowing Christ. Both salvation and sanctification relate to our standing before God because we are seen in Christ. Neither of those positions can be lost by our sins after salvation. Both are secure because of the finished work of Christ. After salvation, Christians often do sin. And that breaks our fellowship with God. But the fellowship is restored by confession of sins directly to God, not to a priest. We see that in 1 John chapters 1 and uh, chapter 1 verses 8 and 10 where it speaks both of our sin nature and of our practice of sin. And all of us do those things after we are saved. But verse 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses from all sin. What is the worst sin you ever did? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin your salvation and your sanctification are by faith are the work of the Spirit of God. When you trusted Jesus Christ, he began a work in you. He takes you as you are, but he does not leave you as you are. He takes you as you are and he begins to work on you by his Spirit through the washing of the water of the Word to bring you into conformity with the image of Christ. That's not legalism. That's not you striving in the flesh to keep the works of the law. That's you yielding to the Spirit of God when you've presented your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And that's the point at which you are no longer being conformed to the world but you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Oh, the work of grace. Oh, the love of God. Oh, the response of love that we should have to him. And the overflowing of love we should have one to another because we are recipients of the grace of God and of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now hear me clearly, God does have standards. Obedience to his word is because you love him and that's not legalism. Understanding that we're saved by his grace apart from our works gives us an overwhelming love for him that wants to please him in all that we do. That love motivates us to obey. That love motivates us to serve others. That love motivates us to do sacrificial giving. That love also motivates us to obey the word of God, to do things that are pleasing in his sight. When you're motivated by love to obey the word of God, you are not a legalist. You know, when you love somebody, don't you want to please them? When you love somebody, you don't want to hurt them. When you love somebody, you're always sensitive to their presence. You're always sensitive to every word and the slightest movement that they make when they're there in your presence. You're alert, you're attentive, you're ready to help, you're ready to serve. You're ready to express in whatever way you can 
the love that you have for that person. Motivation of love. But you know, God has given us more according to our text today. He's given us his indwelling Holy Spirit who empowers us to crush the flesh which used to dominate our lives. He has given us the supernatural permanent strength to just walk away when the flesh dangles its enticements in front of us. God, the Holy Spirit, now gives us what we might call a do line, a distant early warning like our strategic air command bombers. He gives us a do line so that we have a heads up when temptation is approaching. And he arms us with the spiritual armor of Ephesians 6 so that we are prepared to do battle, quote, in the power of his might, not the flesh. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. In the power of his might, that is, the power of the Spirit of God. Your enemies, the world, the flesh, the devil, the demons, they want you to believe that true freedom is when you are looking out for old number one. They want you to believe that true freedom is when you're selfish and self-interested and covetous and angry and greedy. In other words, the works of the flesh which are listed here in this passage. That's what will really make you free. But Galatians 5 lists these works of the flesh as the result of the wrong empowerment, the wrong motivation, the wrong means. The works of the flesh are always wrong ways to obtain freedom. True liberty is motivated by love. It's empowered by the Spirit of God. It is obtained by walking by faith. Remember those verses? Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You can fall back under this. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. That's where God puts you. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. When somebody says you're a legalist because you have standards, remember what they're trying to tempt you to is the works of the flesh. But by love serve one another, for all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. When that occurs, when you walk in the Spirit, when you walk by faith, when you walk in the power that God has provided, you will see the results of true liberty, a far greater liberty than anything we have ever experienced politically in this country. A liberty that is greater than anything anyone can experience socially or economically or religiously in their religions. You will see the results of true liberty. The Spirit will produce in and through your life the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And he gives the contrast, against such there is no law. Oh, don't try to be justified by the law. Don't try to be saved by the law. Don't try to be sanctified by the law. Let the Spirit of God produce in you true freedom, true liberty. Against such there is no law. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, there's our position. Let us also walk in the Spirit. There's our practice. Remember where we began? Remember it well when you're accused of being a legalist or tempted to be a libertine. The first contrast was the flesh versus the spirit. The contrast between the two principal empowerments that struggle for supremacy in the Christian life in our pursuit of freedom. The second contrast, works versus faith. A contrast between the two principal means that people follow in their pursuit of salvation or sanctification. And the final set of contrasts that Paul hammers out, law versus grace and love couplet. 
a contrast between the two principal motivations that people follow in their desire to be justified and sanctified. Will you walk in the flesh or will you walk in the spirit? Will you try to reach the goal by works or by the walk of faith? Will you place yourself back under the law or will you be a thankful recipient of the grace of God and of his love poured out into your life so that you might love God in return and love one another? Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the freedom, the liberty that is ours in Christ. How we thank you for the commission you've given to us to preach the gospel to every creature. Starting in our Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The necessary boldness, the bravery, if you will. We have been given freedom. Now are we brave enough to proclaim it, to stand for the truth, regardless of who opposes us, the world, the flesh, or the devil. Thank you, Father, for the liberty that is ours in Christ Jesus. Help us not to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.